Welcome back to another Free Agents Podcast. As always, it's Baz here. I've got the best forward in Miami history, Rigged One Walker with me. Oh, shoot. <laughs> and I've got the goon for the Indiana Pacers, Chuck Artest. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about the NBA Awards. I'm going to talk about the current playoff series. I'm going to talk about what will the playoffs or the teams, sorry, that have been eliminated from the playoffs, what the future looks like then going forward into the future. But first, as always, once again, we have the news with Chuck. Please take it. All right, so the Brooklyn Nets have signed Captain Canada. Steve Nash is the new head coach this, for this next season. Um, they finished the seventh seed in the East without Kyrie and, Kyde, and KD, so keep an eye on them next season. Um, we got some wholesome news, which made Rig very happy. The NBA allowed families back into the bubble, and you saw a little baby section at the Bucks and Heat game. Very it's going to lift the spirits of some of the players there, which have been there for quite some time. And some big awards, so boys, please hold your applause. Montrez Harrell has been named the sixth man of the year, being presented his award by Sweet Lou Williams. Brandon Ingram, most improved player. And the big one, boys, 2020 Rookie of the Year, Ja Morant. All right, all right. I don't think I've picked one yet. I think the only one I picked was Ja Morant. Yeah. Everyone was robbed. (laughs) Everyone was robbed. (laughs) One one vote for Zion. Who voted for Zion? What is going on? Probably Doris Burke. Probably Doris. (laughs) Probably. Well, let's talk about the awards. I feel like this is going to be a quick and easy one to talk Mm. about. We'll start with the Rookie of the Year. This was unanimous, in my opinion. It should have been. It should have been. Whoever voted for Zion, no, take their credentials away. I'm over it. Because Zion actually finished third. I know. Behind Kendrick Nunn. He should have. Kendrick Nunn was a solid player this year. Zion, we talked about this. Zion didn't play enough. It went to the right person, but it should have been unanimous. But at least he got it. I think Zion next year... It was staying healthy, he should have a better season. He'll win Rookie season. of the Year next year. Yeah, he, should have, he should have just been injured all season, not yeah. playing, then got Rookie of the, the Year Ben next Simmons, year. mate. The Ben Simmons. He should have done the Benny Simmons. And then the more surprising one for me personally was a sixth man of the year for Trez, Montrez Harrell. Yeah, I had um, Dennis Schroeder, and I thought it was pretty comfortable for me. Just because I think what he did for the team meant a lot more considering how everyone had written off OKC. I felt like I expected Montrez Harrell to play that way off the Clippers bench. Because he was pretty much a starter just starting off the bench because they had the height with Zubaj. So, uh, if Lou Williams didn't win it so many times, do you think it would have gone to still gone to Trez or would it have gone to Lou? Yeah, I think that, I think that definitely played a part that Lou Williams had so many considering he was already on the roster. I feel like that's why they get it, It's probably going to go to a Clippers player regardless. But I still think Schroeder was maybe not robbed, but I think he was a lot closer than voting showed. Yeah, I haven't even seen the voting, so I don't know how it actually ended. I think Sweet Lou finished in second, to be honest. But it, it like Montrezl Hall definitely deserved. It. He had a great season. But I just think Schroeder's impact to OKC is more important than what Montrezl Harrell did for the, uh, the Clippers. Yeah, and you originally picked Brandon Ingram to win most improved. Yeah, I, I had Shea Gilgis or Brandon Ingram to win. Um, look, I like Brandon Ingram, but I expect this out of a guy who got picked second, so I hardly follow the improvement. Like he should have been like this always. And yeah, he's, he's also like, getting a lot more minutes and a lot more touches in New Orleans. Like He's the go-to guy. He is the go-to guy. Um, it'll be Zion next year, but for the moment, he's the go-to guy. I feel like Shea Gilgis, again, it's not enough spoken about how the impact of those players on OKC pushed them to where they are. And I feel like OKC walk out of this with absolutely nothing. And it's disappointing considering they're given a 0.4 or 0.2% chance to make the playoffs. They make the playoffs. They're competitive in the playoffs. And two of their guards are extremely good at such a young age. Yeah, and with Schroeder playing a big role and then Shea Gill just playing a big role as well, pushing the Rockets to seven, which we'll talk about later. I think there needs to be a bit more credit due. Put some respect on what OKC did. That's just my feelings. But look, you can't be mad at who got the awards though. It's not like someone was like, no. not who shoot, came out of nowhere. It was given to players who were playing well for both six men and most improved, but I, I just had different picks. Yeah, I feel like BI, everywhere you, everywhere you looked at, it was, it was always going to be Brandon Ingram. Yeah, Brandon Ingram was always going to be great this year, in my opinion, because moving out of the spotlight in LA, getting more touches, getting more minutes, being the go-to guy, this is what I expected out of him when he got drafted, though. And that's why, for me, he's not most improved. I know people were talking like Doncic was going to get it. And I'm like, it's hard for a guy picked as high as he is to not be doing that every single week anyway, in my opinion. The voting for the most improved went, Brandon Ingram got 42 points for first. Uh, Bam Adebayo got 38 points mm. for first and Luka Doncic got 12. Yeah, so you look at it and Shea Gilgis not even getting votes in the first place. I, like, I really like Bam, but I was trying not to be too much of a Heatles fan. Bam's a great player. Um, he was Mr. Basketball in North Carolina. I just want to put it out there. And then he went to Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chapel Hill, I'm out. 
Oh, man. So, Eastern Conference semis and Western Conference semis mm. have now in full swing. Yep. Clippers and Nuggets have played. The Clippers took out the first game. Yep. How do you feel like the series is going to go? Because I feel like the Nuggets are gassed. Yeah, that's the first thing I was going to mention. Like, they just look tired. And they, and so they should be. That was a incredible seven-game series against the Jazz coming down to a final shot that almost went in and out. So I'm not surprised they're a bit flat. I do see them getting a game, though. So I think in maybe five, maybe six games, um, I think they'll probably lose the first two and then pick up a cheap third because the Clippers will be sitting pretty and think they're comfortable. But um, I have the Clippers to go through mostly just because of the way that they're playing with the rest. All their players are back finally. They're all healthy. Pat Bev played for the first time in, uh, in the bubble. So I feel like it's just going to be not a run over, but I just don't think the Nuggets have the star quality or the players in the right position to compete with the Clippers. Yeah, and Kawhi then starts to turn it on as well. Yeah. 29 points, three assists, two rebounds. He, he's playing he's like killing it. playoff Kawhi like he did last season. He has a bit of that Kobe movement to him, like the footwork as well, especially from the mid-range. Like it's actually pretty scary. He picked the ball up with his offed hand and drove and dunked it. And I was like, imagine picking it like I'm right-handed. Imagine me I'd clamp the ball with your left hand and just take two power steps and just rack. So he's just a really good player and he looks very smooth in everything he does and he shows zero emotion, which works for him. Yeah, he's a great player. He's playing well. He's turning it up on the right time. The other in LA team played Houston. Obviously, the mm. LA Lakers matched up with Houston in the in the Western Conference of a semi, and they actually lost. Yeah, and quite a convincing loss by fifteen, I believe. Yeah, and at one point, I think it was outwards of twenty five points. Yeah. So that well, Lakers are now zero and three against the Rockets. So going throughout back the to, whole season, throughout the whole season, yeah. including the regular the season, small ball. Yeah, the small ball lineup. <clears throat> it seems to work against this Lakers team, and I don't know if it's just. In my opinion, it's got nothing to do with AD and LeBron. AD I think it comes down to the guards. Sorry to interrupt you, but the right. guards defend. I agree. I agree. Because AD had 25 and 14. You'd expect if he was having those numbers, they would win. So I don't know how much more you can ask of him, but the guards need to maybe play better defense against someone like Westbrook and Harden. Westbrook seemed to have a better game than he had against the Nuggets. Um, he shot a lot better, including one where he turned to the babies in the crowd and Gave him a few choice words. <laughs> <laughs> but you got Brody and the Beard had 60 points between them and they went to the free throw line over 16 times. You you can't afford that if you're LA. You need to keep them out of the paint. You need to force some contested shots. Um, you can't get Westbrook out in the fast break. It just seems like they need to slow the pace down a lot, similar to what the Heat did. Westbrook was struggling against the Thunder when he first came back. Like He threw away threw away the game, essentially. Yeah, in game six, in he game definitely six, yeah. threw it away. And I, But I think you need to remember, firstly, injury. Secondly, yeah. the emotion of playing against OKC. Thirdly, the bubble. He hasn't played a ton in the bubble. So there's three, not excuses, but you can understand why he's maybe not in his rhythm. But he has to play well against what is a very poor guard rotation for the Lakers. Because Rondo made a return. He played nine minutes. Mm. And he's yeah. going to have to play. He's going to get a big, he's going to get a lot more minutes, sorry, moving forward into the next game. Because he's going to have to play defense on probably Westbrook and I wouldn't be surprised if he matches on Harden for a bit as well but this is actually where they miss Avery Bradley yeah Avery Bradley is the linchpin in this series and he would have made a huge difference I think maybe the Caruso could step in and help out on um, James Harden and maybe defend him just because he's got a little length he's very he hustles hard and he doesn't give away a ton of fouls but I just this is a big concern for the Lakers right now I know they're only down one but LeBron and AD played very well and they still lost by 15. Yeah like I don't want to jump to conclusions after a team loses one where they shouldn't I feel like the Lakers yeah. should always have one as with the Clippers winning their game. But with the bubble, man, like everything's so all over the shot. Well, is it going to be Paul all over again, lose game one and then sweep straight through the rest? Like yeah. it's hard to say with only one game played. But I just, my concern as I said out of the first um, game was you let Eric Gordon get 23 points. If he gets cooking, that's not ideal. Um, and AD and LeBron had statistically good games, but they still lost. So that's the only two real big concerns for me. And then the other semi final in the East, which is has a lot of interest, is the Celtics and the Raptors. Yeah. Big series. Um, didn't start the way I thought personally. I thought the Raptors would be a lot more competitive in games one and two, but obviously we saw they found an absolute lifeline in game three with OG. I'm going to butcher the last one. Ananobe? OG Ananobi. 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 Straight out from <coughs> London, Britain. That's it. The, the, Wag, Wagwan. <laughs> the, biggest, <laughs> the biggest Gandhi of a shot I've seen in a long time. Um, but uh, again, at the end of the day, it's always a bit of luck in every shot you take. So he got the right one and pulled the series back. Yeah. Jason Tatum was guarding absolute air. He yeah. was guarding nobody. They were running as a zone. Jason Tatum's running air, and Ananubi's just sitting there open on the on and the wing. And I feel wing. like um, 
Credit to Larry for finding that over a nine, what do you say, nine foot tall taco fall, and he still found that pass. Yeah. Let's yeah. bring Taco Ford to defend the inbound and he gets thrown straight <laughs> <Yeah>. over him. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Taco Fall minus three for the night. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Point five <laughs> seconds. That's bad. Cool. <laughs> Plus minus is not ideal for Taco there. But um, Spicy P still struggling a little bit. Um, he's not showing the same form he did last season. Is it? It's probably because. Um, Without Kawhi now, there's a lot more pressure on him. They know he's the kind of go-to scorer. Uh, Fred Van Fleet hasn't been scoring as well as he had in the bubble regular season finale. Um, so I'm a bit concerned for the Raptors. They definitely have the talent to keep up with the Celtics. It's just a matter of not whether they can hit their shots and keep up with the, the rising superstar, Jason Tatum. After watching the first three, gra- first three games, I'm actually convinced the Celtics are going to win this. I think they should win this. I think it goes to six. Or seven at least. Like I'd be shocked if it doesn't go to six. Just just because like okay, one one thing I do want to point out is Marcus Soul on the pick and roll. Garbage. How Absolute. old is that guy? He had to be 33, 34. But it's he doesn't thirty five. He doesn't come there even, even more. He doesn't come up aggressively. He sits back sits back too passively. And when he gets caught in a pick and roll with Tatum and Tice, he's lost. He's lost. And he gets made to look silly. And then and then pretty sure Ke- he was the play where Kemba Walker found Tice behind him for that dunk. Yeah, he was like, doubling up Kemba. I don't exactly. know why. He should have just gone back to his Exactly. Spot. But it's just the way on the pick and roll, he seems like he do- he either hesitates or he's not sure where he needs to be against the players. And that's killing them. Because you look at players like Kemba, um, Brown, and Tatum can all get a nice shot off. And he just seems to struggle there. And that's just, you can't afford that. Yeah, so we've got the Celtics beating the Raptors and then the other Eastern semi who will they most likely face between the Heat and the Bucks because the Heatles are up three to nothing. Can the Heatles. I want I don't want to say too much, but I'm I'm excited. I'm happy. I like I didn't expect us to get this far, to be honest, in the season. Um I would have been happy if we run the first round and were at least competitive in the second round, but they've played extremely well uh, against the Bucks. And as we all know, no NBA team has ever come back from an 0-3. Uh, like deficit in a seven game series only three series have actually ever gone to game seven but none of them have been won so you're looking at the Heatles are sitting in historically comfortable position and Giannis is nursing an ankle injury from the last game and is questionable for game four which is a bit of a concern I think if it goes down to 3-1 it's only been done like eight times or 14 so even to come back from 3-1 because the Nuggets did it against the yeah. Jazz and then it's still hard the big one the Believe Land over the Warriors yeah, that was the first time ever in finals history, but just overall in the playoffs. It's yeah. not done on a regular basis. And even basis. then, it doesn't happen. Well, no one wins nah. a series. So um, we'll see how it, it sort of plays out. Um, the two notes that I want to take away from this series so far is Giannis is giving up a ton of offensive fouls. He's doing a lot of what I call cheap fouls early in the, the start of the game where he's getting caught trying to go to the bucket and someone under the heat just slides across and gets underneath him. And he's getting done for charges. And you can't afford those two early fouls. He leads the league, or I think he's second in the league in charges this season, um, getting charges. So actually, giving charges, I should say. So he needs to be a bit more careful trying to get out of the basket. So he definitely doesn't have a jump shot. Yeah. Um, and the second one is Brooke Lopez and Milton have been really good in the middle parts of the game. Like they kept them in the game yesterday through the second and third quarter, but they've just gone missing in the fourth. And you can't afford for them to go missing in the fourth. Middleton, as we talked about prior to the playoffs, he's the linchpin to the Bucks' success. Because yeah, when you watch Giannis play, like I remember specifically, he was getting guarded and he, he doesn't have a jump shot. And he just forced his way to the basket. And it's actually incredible to get into the basket sometimes. And he draws Super the foul. Good. Like, it's insane. But down the stretch, like, he has no jump shot. And you, you need someone to, to obviously tie the game up and make a game-winning shot. And... You struggle on who you're going to give the ball to. Well, because you can't go to your best player. That's it. And what you, you've probably been noticing is the Heat are kind of running this 3 2 zone that's not so much of a normal zone. They're dropping the front three back a little bit and creating like a semi wall. And they'll put like Dragic, Jimmy Butler, and someone like a Bam or a Kelly O'Linick who's got a bit of size. And they'll make this half wall at the top of the key just so Giannis can't drive. Yeah. Forcing someone else to beat them and trying to see if they can recover in time to get a contest on the shot. And it seems to be working, especially late in the game, because if you can't get to the bucket as Giannis, you're forcing up a three, and we know that's not a high percentage shot. And that's a shot you're going to settle for if you're the Heat. Anyway. You're comfortable with that. So I think, I don't, I don't know how they're going to come back, come back at all, to be honest, um, especially with Giannis uh, nursing an injury. But someone like Middleton, Lopez started really well yesterday, hit quite a few threes. Um, but the role players just got to hit shots. 
Yeah, and you need your star player to step up. Like the role players can do the best of their capabilities, but if your best player isn't performing, well, he's only he's not only is he he's performing, but he's not getting enough time, in my opinion. Like I know we're used to being sport like players like LeBron, Kawhi, who are going for forty minutes per game in the playoffs, but Giannis is only averaging thirty three minutes in the playoffs. You're down oh three. He needs to play almost the full whack. He's got to play the most minutes he's ever played if you have a chance of winning. Yeah, he should be playing 38 to 40 minutes in every single game moving forward. He didn't even play the most minutes of, of the team yesterday. It was uh, Chris Middleton picked up 36 minutes and Brook Lopez 38 minutes. There you go. So, like, you can't afford to have those two guys as logging the most minutes in the game. I don't think Giannis is unfit. We certainly don't think he's an unfit guy. He's an absolute athlete. He needs to be on the court. Even if he's missing shots, his defensive prowess uh, and his ability to alter Miami's shots is enough to have him on the floor even if he's not offensively playing well. But that ankle injury yesterday may mm. have impacted how long he played. It, it probably did, and it didn't look very good from the start. From when was it just a it. rolled ankle? Yeah, it's just a rolled ankle, and he just did it on his own, didn't hit anyone's foot or anything, just sort of tried to stop, and it just sort of rolled over itself. Um, I know it says he's questionable, but you're 0-3. He's playing. There's he's no playing. doubt, but it's not going to sit it out. Let's no. be realistic here. <clears throat> but, again, history is not on the side of the Bucks. So with the Raptors and Bucks. Basically, I like to say on the verge of elimination. Well, the Bucks are anyway. The Raptors are down down with one game. They both made the Eastern Conference mm. Finals last year, and they could potentially get eliminated in the semis, which is a step back from last year. What will the next season, or what will the will there be any changes to the roster moving forward? We'll start with the Raptors. Yeah, like for Toronto, it's still quite a success where they're at. I think what a lot of people forget to note is they lost a top five player in Kawhi in the off season. So for them to be on the same trajectory as they were last season while missing one of the best players in the NBA is very impressive. They have a very, very old team, though, which yeah. is my concern. I think Kyle Lowry's at 31. Chuck just told us earlier that Gasol's 35. I think Abarca's 30 or 31 as well. He's getting on. So you've got a lot of guys heading into their mid-30s or early 30s, and you need to get a bit younger to help out those players like Ananube, um Fred Van Fleet, Siakam. Because exactly. I know Ananubi's 23 and Fred Van Fleet's going to be around 24. I think he's 25, Siak- yeah. Siakam's, Siakam's around that sort of range there. So yeah. I don't think you do anything drastic because you're still in the East, but possibly you need to get a little bit younger or maybe find some role players that are a bit younger to sort of work around um, Lowry. And oh, I don't know what you do with Marcus Gasol at his age because he just seems to be getting absolutely taken advantage of on the def- defensive end. I think you just have to release him. Well, they've got to sign Fred Van Fleet this offseason. Yeah. So he's going to get considerable money for sure. So, look, I'm not concerned, but I think they maybe just need to get younger. And if that means moving on from someone like Gasol and trying to get a younger center. Um, but they're at a bit of a like sort of point where you're like, do you go all in or do you just let it go? Because they've only got one or two more seasons with that roster, if that. But are they even going to make a challenge with that roster? That's that's my concern. Yeah, they need to make a choice between whether they just try and contend and really go after it. So maybe make a trade package, see if they can pick up someone. Like, I really think they could pick up Oladipo. Um, he's only got one year left in his contract, so Indiana might be keen to move him. He's not very been very healthy, but you know you can have a two-man like him uh, and push Siakam maybe to the four. And play Ibaka at the five because Ibaka has played at the five before, and yeah. Gasol to the bench that could also work. Um, but they need to decide whether they're contending, or if they're not quite rebuilding, but not not sort of mid mid tier in the East, like making six, five, six. Yeah, in because the East. they can they're still competing. They can be very competitive in the East with the roster they have next season going forward, and with the other teams around them, obviously. Yeah, and exactly the bottom right. half especially not being so great. So with the wraps done with the Bucks. Yeah, the so Bucks. I think it's going to be a different story here. Yeah, the Bucks is a really interesting one. Um, we got Giannis obviously coming off contract um, and not making the East a couple years. I'm um, not making the finals a couple years in a row. You need to do something a little bit drastic if you want to. Like, there's two scenarios here with the Bucks. If you want to keep Giannis, you need to do something drastic, or two, you move Giannis on. Do they have the pieces though to do something drastic? Because I don't think they do. No, I don't think so either, but you could possibly package someone like Middleton and Bledsoe together. Middleton's going to have to go if you want to Yeah, it's got to be it's got to be Do You know he's getting paid 40 million in like 24, 25. Wow. Okay, that's crazy. <laughs> I didn't know that. He's on like that's 26, too much money. 26 million this year. I'm pretty sure he's like 29 as well, or 29 Yeah, he, by the time he's 34, he's, he's going to have like a like Chris Paul contract oh, like 40 million. Perhaps to Chris Middleton's agent for that one. That's well played. But <laughs> two-time all-star, bro. 
Okay. <laughs> remember, remember when, uh, remember when the entire Atlanta Hawks team were in All Stars and then they got swept in the first round. Yeah. I'm not swept, but I think they lost in the first <laughs> round. Okay, so you move Bledsoe and Middleton for someone, which, we, which is probably your second and third best player on the Bucks. Yeah, it, it should be. I mean, Brooke Lopez is playing out of his skin, and credit to him. Like back in his Nets days, the man couldn't hit a jumper to save his life. He was very much a low post guy, and now he's hitting like Steph Curry range threes. So you definitely keep Lopez on the roster. I think at seven foot one and with the ability to shoot the three he he has, he's fantastic. Um, you've probably got to move Middleton, and I think if you can package Bledsoe with it as well, um, who you go for. Oh, I don't know. I really don't know. You can maybe try and pick up someone like DeRozan, who has got a player option, so he can, you know, they can trade for that think another year to see if Giannis, DeRozan, and and Lopez can do it. But I'm actually more leaning to Giannis leaving. Um, in, there's, there's, in my opinion, two real suitors for him: um, the Heat, Toronto, and or a sign and trade. But I think those are the only two teams that can financially afford him. Um, as a res- unrestricted free agent, but you've got to make a move, and it starts with Bledsoe and Middleton for me. If the Bucks get swept by the Heat, do you reckon that impacts Giannis's decision to move to Miami? Well, I, we personally, talking, I think no. We were talking about this off off air. I, I'm happy that the, the Heat are in a position to possibly sweep, but as a Heat fan looking to the future, I'm like, is this going to be a KD moment to come back and bite us? Will Giannis leave the Bucks to come and play for the team that swept him the season before? He's going to get a lot of hate for that. Is that going to impact his decision? So I'm kind of like, ah. Oh. I want to sweep the Bucks, but I don't want Giannis to be like, oh, I'm not going to do a KD. I saw what happened there and join the team that beat me out of the playoffs. So I think it could definitely affect him, but I think he wants to stay at the Bucks. He wants to stay at the Bucks. That's fine, but I think he needs to look, in, look into it wholeheartedly and see where am I going to win. Yeah. And it's not going to be Milwaukee. Well, because he's got the individual accolades now. It's about getting those team accolades to cement his legacy. And we forget he's only 25. Yeah, because LeBron didn't win his first ring till 28. Yeah, that's it. So you forget he's still very young. Um, but he also, with what's happened with this COVID situation and sort of the implications the financials will have on the salary cap, I know he's due a Supermax, but whether the Bucks can actually afford to pay him a Supermax just with the money. Because obviously it's going to be a lost, lot of lost revenue. I know there's salary cap space for it, but is the are the Bucks owners going to be willing to give a super max deal to Giannis in current financial circumstances? Yeah, I mean we'll have to wait and so- find out what happens. There's when it's a lot, ends, a lot of pieces to happen with the Bucks and stuff we won't know until we, we get deep into the the off season. Yeah. So round two of the playoffs is in full swing. What does the future look like for the teams? You know that have left the bubble already. We'll start with Portland. Yeah, Portland is a, is a tough one. Um, And there's two reasons. One, they didn't have a healthy season. There was Nurkic out, Collins was out. They didn't have their full squad together. So I don't want to jump to the conclusion and just say, I'll blow it up and trade everyone. Because obviously it's hard to judge a team that I thought would have been top four in the West when the roster they had wasn't the same roster that competed every day in the regular season. They got it together at the end of the the bubble and we saw what that team could do. So for me, um, you look to the... Bring back Mello. That's first priority. I thought he played really well. I think he'll give you some solid branch, uh, presence when Zach Collins gets healthy. You can bring Zach Collins in, uh, play him at the four, and you can play Nurkic at the five. And Trevor Ariza as well. He didn't come to the bubble. They have him as well. So you bring Mello, Ariza back, Nurkic, Collins, CJ McCollum, um, and obviously Dame time at the, at the one. That's a really solid team. Yeah. And they got the young tal- the, the young draft pick. I won't say young talent yet, but Nasir Little, who's... Got, yeah, they got high hopes on him as well. He didn't play much this season, so he may play a role next season moving forward. Yeah, that's it. The only other, the other, other thing I could think of is maybe possibly they get another big man for some sort of like injury security. Um, possibly in the draft, they could pick up someone like Vernon Carey. He's um, quite a solid big man. He's not an overly fantastic offensive talent, but he does his sort of role. Yeah, he can get you. He could get you easily ten and ten every night if you want it. So I think maybe with the lack of depth they have at the center position, you definitely bring him in. But I think Portland don't need to do anything drastic. I think they give another season or two at least. Yeah, they should compete next season. I don't think they're going to blow it up. No, no, no. I don't think, and there's no one out there to blow it up for. No. There's no one really in trade rumors who you're like, oh yeah, they're better than the two stars in McCollum and Lil that they have, or they can't really package something together without leaving a hole in that lineup. Yeah, that's right. And then we've got Dallas who had a great series against the Clippers, Paul Zingas, mm. obviously tore his meniscus in his knee. They lost in six to the Clippers. Yeah, which is super impressive considering you're missing your second best player and also someone like Paul Zingas, the unicorn, very impressive player. Just 
I feel for Doncic that he went out because I think that they would have pushed it to seven games. But here's the tough part now. You look at it and you go, what do you do? Because you've got two really young and very talented players in Porzingis and Doncic, but you've also got nothing really around them. You've got Tim Hardaway Jr. who's getting paid a lot of money, but not really giving you a lot of sort of... um, statistical advantage for that you got seth curry who is he a starting point guard in today's league i wouldn't think so i think he's definitely a bench player um you're struggling at the sort of three position dorian finney smith who i don't mind but i just he kind of feels like another michael kid gilchrist who's also on that roster just a three yeah but he can shoot the basketball michael he can can he can definitely shoot the basketball better but i just don't think that like you can rely on him to start i think he's a guy who comes off he's an energy bloke yeah 100 percent. he's a guy who comes off the bench like a ronnie (laughs) toria don't give ronnie too much (laughs) but what i see is they have really good young centers in dwight powell and willie cauley stein like two really big energy guys that can play off Porzingis and who can do all the grunt work and the dirty work like you remember Dwight Powell didn't play he's injured he was out for the season so he didn't play as well so for me it's the draft and I know it's not a great draft I know it's not a deep it's a deep draft but not a great draft in terms of talent but picking at 18 if they can sneak if they can snag someone like Cole Anthony Theo Maladon or RJ Hampton a sort of two-way point guard shooting guard I think it really works well with someone like Doncic. These are guys who can get their own baskets, but can also dribble the ball in late game situations. And they've all played at decent levels. You know, Cole Anthony at North Carolina, RJ Hampton had already has already done the pros for a year in Australia and New Zealand here. I just think that if you can get someone that can hold the ball off Doncic and give him some room to sort of have a breather and a break on offense and get their own basket, yeah. that's what Dallas does. I expect Dallas to compete next season. They should be in the playoffs. Hopefully, KP Pazingas comes back healthy. Mm. And then, you know, they should be with 50-win team. Yeah, I think there's no doubt they can definitely be that fourth, fifth seed in the, the West comfortably, um, especially with the rise away Doncic is playing. I think you maybe might need to get some bench scoring, a bit more bench scoring, so there's not so much pressure on Doncic to do all the scoring and the starters. But they don't need to do a lot. I mean, if they want to get a bit drastic, they might tr- do a trade for someone like, again, an Oladipo yeah, or a I don't, the pieces to I don't think they have the pieces, but also those teams might be looking to offload you know, $30 million contract in DeRozan and $25 million, I think, for Oladipo, just something to get rid of. Because at the end of the day, the way I look at it is if they got a nice third piece that can score, it might be a very nice way for Dallas to take that next step up. Yeah, and with the team that finished fifth this season, Oklahoma City Thunder, mm. I was proud to be a fan because actually just to see them compete, at one point I thought they were going to get swept. Yeah, it didn't look good for them to start it no. off. Going down 2-0, then they took it to game seven. And yeah, unfortunately, the way they played in Game Seven was just lack of playoff experience. It felt like to me, that last two minutes they seemed to really struggle against um, against the Rockets. Uh, it's hard. I don't know what you do with them. They're a weird team. Like you're gonna have Gallinari, who's a free agent this off season. Um, he'll be due twenty million. A lot of a lot of contenders like the Clippers, yes. the Lakers. Someone will want him. Will want him. Yeah, so, someone Miami. Will want him. Yeah, you can easily pick him up for $20 million, even if it's a two-year contract or something like that. It allows you still cap flexibility, but also a 20. He can score 20 on a night. Um, you've got the three-headed monster in Shea Gilgis, in Schroeder, and Paul. Chris Paul. Yep. But Chris Paul's, what, 37? Jock, might have to check that up for me. he's that old, is he? I feel like he's that old. Uh, CP3 <laughs> is... 35. Yeah. 35, but 35... His at, contract goes to is 37. And though. he's making $40 million a year. That is what, 30% of your cap space, I believe, off the top of my head. So you look at that and you go, do they move Chris Paul? He was the leader of your side. But also you've got two young guards who are ready to take over themselves. Yeah. And future Hall of Famer, Luke against Dort. Luke against, you're very Put it in Dort. Dort mode. That's it, kind of Dort. <laughs> but yeah, you've got some good pieces. I really think you move Paul on. It sucks for him. I don't know if anyone's going to pick him up though. Or oh, be able to afford See, him. it's affordability. It's not who... Someone will pick... Mate, the way he played, someone will pick Chris Paul up. Like, yeah. if the Lakers could afford him, they would take him in a heartbeat. Yeah, so would the Bucks. Yeah, exactly. Bucks is another spot that could definitely... If they could afford him, they'd take him. So... But I'm not taking Chris Middleton. No, you're not I've taking... Been taking him. I've been talking to P-Money. Don't want him. <laughs> Sam Presley, P-Money. Don't want him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want him. I don't want Chris. I'm not taking on that contract. <laughs> but... I definitely think it's worth having a look to see with his value very high because, you know, people weren't high on him last season after he got traded to OKC with his value really high this offseason. 
it's probably worth looking to move him along and see if they can pick something up. Yeah, and after this season, I think people now realize he wasn't the problem at Houston. Thank Same about, with Jimmy Buckets about at time, Minnesota and, about Fi- time. Minnesota and Philly. Too many times, I feel like Chris Paul has been the scapegoat for what was someone else on his team just being absolutely like a cancer to the roster. Yeah. And I think it's the bubble has created the reckoning and we now realize that it wasn't Jimmy Buckets or Chris Paul's fault at all. Yeah. I could actually see OKC because they've got a lot of draft picks moving forward and they could make a trade. Yeah, yeah. they've got a ton of those. What, four or five, I think, in the next two or three years. They've so, got like 13 in total moving up for the yeah. next five years. So you've and got the Houston pieces. Clippers. So they could actually, based off the season they had, finishing fifth and getting 46, 47 wins, they could make a push moving forward next season and go, okay, I think we've got the capability to challenge here. And they could trade for a star like Bradley Beal. Yep. Like they could just trade because Washington Wizards will take some draft picks. A hundred percent. If you can give them two draft picks, they'll take it. Like as I said, you probably have to give them Stephen Adams as well, which I'm happy to do. Yeah, like I think especially in the way the game's played at the moment, Stephen Adams is he's just great player. Gets you really good rebounding, solid defending, but he's not scoring. And in the current way that small ball lineups are going, he's just becoming non like non necessity at all. You don't need him. And at twenty something million dollars a year it's probably best to see if you can move him on and try and find someone a bit smaller, but a bit more agile and a bit more uh, offensively minded to step into that five role. But you've also got um, Darius Bentley, who I'm very high on. Darius can... Baisley. Is it... oh, sorry, Baisley. Baisley, yeah. <laughs> Bentley. <laughs> Baisley, who I, I think can really shoot the three. Um, yeah. That's what happens when you have an apprenticeship at New Balance. Yeah. <laughs> internship, sorry. Internship <laughs> for a year. So I think he's a solid player um, and he's only young, 2021. 20, yeah. So... You've got the pieces. You've got the draft capital to trade. Time to move Chris Paul on, I believe. I think they try and keep Chris Paul and they could actually trade and try and upgrade Stephen Adams and get Embiid. Ooh. It comes down to affordability, but if you've got Chris Paul, Schroeder... Well, what if you move Schroeder Gilgis. and keep Paul and Gilgis? Yeah, but you need a six-man. Yeah, but you need a six-man that's getting $15 million a year when you've got a starting rotation that's getting 40 Yeah, but it's hard to get players that can do that it's true it's hard to find a solid six man in the league at this stage especially a guard who can get his own basket who can control the ball because i think what people have to realize now this goes for most teams that want to make a trade like especially for the bucks like it's hard to get another established star that isn't comfortable yeah because the only one i can think of that's in a team that isn't competing that could potentially move is damien lillard yeah damien lillard and bradley beal is probably the next closest in my opinion yeah uh, I think because he, you know it would have been Paul George last season, then you're not going to get yeah, him. Yeah, you're not going to get him, and then the free agents this season are, and you know, no one's probably getting Damian Lillard either. If you want to be realistic about no, it, no. So it's tough. You either sort of keep looking for solid role players to build a more deep team, or you just run ahead with what you got. Yeah, because every team has a has a duo. Well, yeah, all the big teams. Well, most most NBA teams nowadays they've got two two established stars in their roster or two all-star caliber players on their roster and they filter around with what are older all-stars or guys who are past it and then solid role players. So OKC definitely has the draft capital to do something with it. It's just they're going to make a decision if they want to get younger and go with their youth or keep Chris Paul there for a veteran who's got some savvy sort of like, um, he can still get 15 points a game and eight assists and he can definitely come off the bench and really help everyone out. I can't see them. I can't see them moving him just because of what they'll get back won't be good enough for for the team. Most likely, I'd just have him for his knowledge to yeah. mentor the guys like Dennis and Shea and, and what, Baisley. And what you said before, Rig, like you saw in Game Seven, you know the the OKC they lacked that experience. I think mm-hmm. having CP three there will help build a little bit more experience and give the guy the, give the young bucks a little bit more of a push for yeah, the next yeah. time around. If you're happy to eat the cap, so be it. But forty million is forty million. I think if we're just being realistic here, if that board didn't go to anyone else but Lou, sorry, if it well, didn't go to Lou Dort, the best, the an improper basketball player or someone that shoots all the time, he's going to take a pump fake, pump fake, dribble, and then bang. have a wide open shot. Yeah, a hundred percent. And look, it's no no fault of Dort. He's still young, still getting in, into the rhythm of the NBA. But an established veteran there would have pump fake, taken a dribble, and then got a shot off. Yeah, and I think we're sitting. Could have yeah. been a different story. Could have been a very different story. and But that's that's the NBA, and that's, you know... Just what you live with. You win some, you lose some. Exactly right. And then the team uh, that lost the Nuggets in the seven series, we actually mm. had a, a dust-up. I want to say a dust-up. <laughs> we had a conversation <laughs> about it. Utah Jazz. Yeah, we argued about this whole week, and uh, you're wrong. It is time to blow it up. No, or... Colonel Sanders, you're wrong. <laughs> Mama's right. Hey, listen, I'm happy to film this in, like, pay-per-view. You know, I'm, I'm we... sure our viewers will pay for you guys to <laughs> ding, box it out. Ding. We, 
there needs to be something done. There needs to be a change. Um, I said it's time to blow it up. I've had a sit down. I think it's maybe that's a bit drastic. Yes, it is. Because you got to remember that Donovan Mitchell has been in the league for three years. I just, and in his second year, they made the playoffs. And who'd they beat? Oklahoma City. Yeah, but they're just, they're in the middle of that Western Conference just doing nothing. Like, <laughs> doing nothing. Okay, well, here's, here's, my, here's my thought. I'm going to put this out here. I'm going to put this out there. You trade Ingles, who is, I love Ingles to death, but is highly overpaid and well into his 30s. Slow Mojo. Slow Mojo. You trade him for K-Love. <laughs> and Cleveland going to take that though? Why not? They want to get K-Love's salary off their books. Ingles has definitely got enough left in the tank to be able to play. K-Love's a fragile man who's always injured. I think Ingles has missed four or five games in his NBA career. R- shake things up a little bit. Yeah, but how, how long is K-Love's contract for? Um, that's like Cleveland wouldn't do that. They yeah. were the worst. They were the second worst team. They were the worst team in the East and tied second worst team in the NBA last season. So you're telling me if they don't tra- if they trade Ingles and a future draft pick for Caleb, Cleveland's going to say no. <laughs> a future draft pick for Kevin Love? Why not? I don't think Cleveland, if he has okay. a healthy seat. What okay? What's Utah missing? A stretch four. You've got Donovan Mitchell at the two. You've got Bogdan, Bogdanovich who's a 20-point scorer that didn't come to the bubble. You've got Mike Conley at the one, and you've got Rudy Gobert at the five, a previous two-time defensive player of the year, and a seven-foot-one guy. What do you need? You can't clog the paint. Joe Ingles is not athletic enough. He didn't shoot that well in the playoffs. You need a stretch four who can rebound, defend a big man, and hit the three. That's Kevin Love. I dropped the mic, but it's attached to the boomstick right now. (laughs) I I don't think Kevin Love... Is going to be able to defend a power forward. I definitely think Kevin Love can still defend a power forward. Nice stretch four. Why not? Because look at who plays power forward these days. But sometimes Jason Tatum's playing power forward. He's sometimes going to get outmatched. There's no doubt about it. But do you think Ingles is keeping up with Tatum? Come on, man. Like His nickname is literally <laughs> Slow Mo Joe. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Bo Jingles. Yeah, that's it. I just think that if they could get a taller stretch four, they'd be a solid team. I don't... Cleveland, actually, the Jazz are going to give a first-round pick. I don't know if they give a first-round pick, but maybe they trade picks. Um, they give them this year's first-round pick, which is not a very deep draft. I think they're sitting somewhere in the late teens. They could possibly give that up and Ingles for K-Love. I just think that someone like Kevin Love, obviously maybe if he has a bit of a renaissance in his um, the way he plays, but if he can stay healthy, I think he gives them a lot at the stretch four position. He's a solid rebounder. We all know that. And he can definitely hit the three. He hasn't been as good as the 2016 Cavs days, but you, you got to remember, Ingles isn't giving you a ton either, realistically. And when you talk about this on a regular basis, you understand how difficult it is to win a championship. Oh, extremely difficult. And to get the right pieces, I still love to know when Kevin Love's contract expires. His contract expires in 2023. 2023, what's he on? 20 million a year, something well, like 28 that? 28 mil a year. It's a lot of money to take on, but I just don't think Jingles is the is the piece there. If you've got Bogdan already playing the three, Jingles is a six foot seven undersized power forward. He's not overly strong kind of guy, and he's not shooting with the same consistency he once was. And he's thirty two, I believe, from memory. Thirty one. He's thirty one at the moment. Thirty one. So he'll be thirty two next season. Why not go for it? Yeah, because Donovan Mitchell's on the verge of getting getting offered a max contract. Yes, he is. So I suppose you might want to keep cap flexibility for that. But you're losing your spark off the bench, Jordan Clarkson. He's a free agent this summer. And he was scoring 15 points a game. And although he's a bit like erratic in his shooting, he can shoot the ball and he can score for you. So you're going to lose him. So what are you going to do for scoring now off the bench as well? Maybe Gordon Hayward goes back to Utah. Oh, I think and reignites his career. Gordon Hayward's on the verge of medical retirement the way he's going. But other than that, I just don't know what they can do. Otherwise, Utah is set for another year of sitting in the sixth. Unless they pick up Gallinari. Yeah, Gallinari is another good option. That could possibly, but you got again, you got to pay him, and he's not going to take a one-year deal. Yeah, but I think he's taking less than Kevin Love. Oh, he's definitely taking less than twenty-eight million a year. I think he's an eighteen to twenty million dollar kind of player, but he'll want a two-year contract. Yeah, it, does that make the difference? Because you play him at the power forward position. Just trade him to the Knicks for some, one of their twenty power forwards. Yeah, can I have Bobby Portis and all thirty of your power forwards? <laughs> but that's actually not a bad idea. I didn't think about someone like Gallinari, but I think they just need a stretch four, a taller four man who can play alongside those guys, get a shot up. He might like he doesn't have to be a defensive monster because you've got Gobert sitting in the paint. Yeah, but Utah could definitely do something, and I think Ingles is going to be unfortunately the victim of that. 
on the old chopping block, yeah, one might it. say. All right, as always, we have questions. Chuck, please. So, um, we had some questions over the week. Uh, again, if you guys want to know, our Instagram is at the Free Agents Podcast. Cheeky plug. Like um, and subscribe. That's it. Like and subscribe is right. Uh, so we had some uh, questions come through. First question here from user at Josh, or sorry, J Josh. Um, if you are LA, the LA teams, both the Clippers and the Lakers, who do you least and most want to see in the finals? Take it away, Baz. I assume we're talking NBA finals here. Yeah, we're doing NBA finals. Yeah. I would love to see like the old days, Lakers and Celtics. Oh, nostalgia. Nostalgia. The Sing. old Kobe Mag- and Paul Pierce. I'm thinking Magic Bird. Oof. Like, that'd be great to see. Yeah, it'd be good. I feel like if the Bucks or Raptors lose, you're happy to play anybody. Yep. Like, I'm not... I wouldn't be fussed if I'm, a, if I'm an LA team playing either the Heat or the Celtics. I'd probably rather play the Heat. Mm. I feel like they're more capable of beating the Heat. And the Celtics will put up a fight. I wouldn't be surprised if the Celtics won the whole thing. Yeah, the way they're playing at the moment. But I disagree with you on the Heat. <laughs> and my reasoning is, for the Lakers, you least want to see the Heat because of three things. They're shooting. You know, they're scoring in a high clip and shooting over 17 to 23s a game. As you see with the the Rockets, they're already causing problems with the way they shoot against the, the Lakers. Their depth, they go 9 to 10 guys deep in their rotation. They go right down with Iggy, Crowder, Leonard, Kelly Olynyk, they go extremely deep into their hero. They go really deep into their roster and the Lakers don't have that. So they can get away with playing more guys for less minutes and keeping them fresher. And lastly, the style of defense. The the Heat really try and force your stars to not beat them. They push it to your role players. Can your role players step up and beat the Heat? Because they're going to try and take away the stars as best as possible. I feel like Bam Adebayo matches up well with AD. He's got the athleticism and the, the movement. Yeah, he's got quick feet. He's got quick feet. Um, he would also keep him busy on the defensive end, on the offensive end, I should say. Uh, I think Crowder is kind of a bit like that Pat Bev dog. Who well, I just... love Jay Crowder when he played at Marquette in college. Yeah, I thought well, I thought he was a great player still in the league. I just yeah. He obviously wasn't wanted um, in the Grizzlies rotation, so he's been moved to the heat. Um, he's been playing out of his skin, shooting really well from three. I think he was 5 of 11, which for him is I thought was quite solid. Um but he could really stir things up with LeBron. And I think they've got multiple players who can guard LeBron. And I just I just believe if you're the Lakers, that's the team you least want to see out of the East. The team you most want to see is the Raptors. Um, they're very similar in their style of play. They lose, ben- they have no bench, de- bench depth, in my opinion, outside of Fred Van Fleet. Um, and they just don't have the speed in their big men to keep up with AD. Like I think Gasol and Ibaka would get made look silly by someone like AD and LeBron uh, in a tandem. And I think the guards would play a part, but I just don't think Lowry, because he's not a very athletic or physical guard, would cause a lot of problems for someone like Rondo Caruso. That's the who Lakers, I want to see. The Lakers most don't want to see the Clippers. And I'm at quite, I don't know. I don't like making predictions because it turns out to be the most obscure thing ever and I'm wrong. But the Lakers, I wouldn't be surprised if the Lakers lose to the Rockets and the Clippers actually come out of the West. Yeah, I could see that. So speaking of the Clippers, I would least want to see, if I'm the Clippers, the Celtics. As you said before, we could see the Celtics winning everything. They got great, they got young stud players that can keep up with PG and Kawhi in Tatum and in Brown. They've got the dog of their own team, Marcus Ma, who's been shooting unbelievable from three. I think he hit six threes last game. And they've also got Tyson Cantor, who are great offensive rebounders and not a solid, not amazing defenders, but solid defenders. So I feel like they best match up against the Clippers roster from top to bottom. And in my opinion, the X factor would be Kemba Walker. Hundred percent. He, he can score twenty to thirty in a night. So if you're the Clippers, you least want to see on paper the Boston Celtics by far. They're also super athletic, good shooters. Um, who you most want to see? has to be the Raptors. And it's for the exact same reason I said the Lakers. they got lack bench depth and they lack length and athleticism. Okay, but if the Raptors don't go through because they're playing the Celtics, mm. Celtics or Heat? Well, I feel like the Bucs aren't going to make it. Let's go to Celtics. Well, I think if the Clippers, you you want to see the Bucs. I think you can beat the Bucs. Again, for the same reasons that LA is going to struggle with the Heat. Um, they're deep. they got 
a lot of length and athleticism. They can keep up with Montrez Harrell and Zubac. Bam Adebayo moves his feet well. And they take a lot of charges and they shoot uh, at a good rate. I would not want to see the... I, I would want to see the Bucks because I feel like with PG, Kawhi, you know, Montrez, Lou Williams, Pat Bev, you've got the defensive prowess and the scoring to beat out a Bucks team run by one bloke in Giannis. Next question. Speaking of Giannis, if the Bucks don't... Uh, sorry, this is from user at Ben Fred Fred. Uh, if the Bucks... Ben Fred Fred. Ben Fred Fred, that's right. <laughs> So if the Bucks don't make the Eastern Conference Finals, and I think we've already spoken about this a few yeah. times, but where does Giannis end up? Yeah, we touched on it a lot earlier. Um, I would like to see him come to the Heat for no bias reasons whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> but um, look, I think a smart move for him personally would be to see how they play out in the offseason, maybe sign a one-year deal because he's still really young. He's only 25. Maybe do what LeBron did in Cleveland and sign a one-year deal with an option. And then if nothing happens next season when the financial flexibility and sort of the the situation with COVID is settled down and, and NBA owners are ready to splash a bit more cash, he can sign a, a, a deal elsewhere. That's how I see it anyway. Well, that's what I would do. I'm so torn on this. Because I don't Play think... torn by Natalie and Brulia. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think... I can't see him leaving the box. This is the issue. Mm. But I feel like it's going to be the best thing to do for him to win. Yeah. Is he ready to win? Is he ready to win? Maybe he goes to Dallas and part- partners up with Luca. Well, Ooh. yeah. I mean, it would have to probably be, oh, have to be a sign and trade or I think just because of their lack of cap flexibility. But and I just trade KP. And trade KP and go Giannis and Doncic, which is good for both teams. Um, well, the best of a bad situation, I think, for the Bucks. But I just, I just don't see him leaving right now. As you said, LeBron didn't win his first chip until 28. Giannis is only 25. He's still working on his jumper. I think he has a lot of love for Milwaukee, and so he should. They gave him a chance. Um, if he wins an MVP, his individual accolades, his second MVP, his individual accolades are over. Most improved um, defensive player of the year and two-time MVP. So you know the next step is I want to win. So I think he gives it another year. I don't want him to give it another year. I want him to pair up with Jimmy Buckets and come to the to the heat. Um but yeah, if it's me in his position, I give it another year to a Cleveland style LeBron James option. See what they can pull out of the, see if they can pull some trades off or maybe get some more depth. Um, maybe get a better point guard that can score. Um, see if they can swing a trade for Bradley Beal, maybe. Um, it's I don't know it's how. so hard because they've got a lot of money tied up in old in old heads. They do, they do. But one more year with those guys still playing at a high level. And then, but he might even opt for security and sign a max deal for five years. Five years, and then force a sign and trade. Paul George, <laughs> grab. Plat P. To, to be short, Ben Fred Fred. I think he's probably going to stay. Wilma. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. All right, last question, boys. Last question from user at Jack Preach. Does Colin Sexton have a chance to win Most Improved next season and take Cleveland to the playoffs? Cleveland. This is for you. Uh, I think this is the first time we've talked about Cleveland on the podcast. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize uh, because I don't we're think... We're talking about Cleveland. We've talked about Cleveland as just like, yeah, LeBron played for the Cavs. We've, we've, we haven't we, talked about the team. We've talked about and the Ke- only... Hey, Kevin Love. Yeah, that's true. We did yeah, talk about Kevin Love. Kevin we talked about the right. only reason that they're ever meant to be talked about, the 2016 NBA championship. But um, yeah, look, I really like Colin Sexton. I think he's a great player. Um, he certainly could. He's scoring eighteen. Uh, sorry, twenty points this season. Eighteen last season. He jumped from sixteen to twenty, and he's pretty sixteen. He's rookie, and he jumped up to twenty this. So in this sophomore, he's certainly sophomore year. got the scoring capabilities. What I want to see is, I think he's only averaging three assists per game. Yeah. Correct, three assists per game. You need to be, as a point guard, at the man handling the ball. Unless you're scoring like twenty five to thirty a game, you've got to get your teammates more involved. And I know he's passing the ball to absolute scrubs outside of my boy Chetty, but Chetty. <laughs> Outside of Chetty Osman, he's passing through some absolute scrubs. But you've got Darius Garland there now. So maybe Darren Fox will start averaging. If he can average around 22, 23 points a game and lift his assist to around six. Colin Sexton. Colin Sexton. While playing with Darius Garland, like getting off the ball a little bit and scoring or getting the ball more and finding players like him or K-Love, who I think will be traded, then he can definitely be in the running for most improved. But similar, and this is, goes a little bit off topic, but similar to players like Darren Fox, uh, it's worth noting that Unless you're in a somewhat a competitive spot, I'm not going to give you most improved. And I think that most of the NBA voters won't. Like I know Brandon Ingram, obviously, he's playing for the Pelicans, got most improved and they didn't make the playoffs. But they were on the cusp of making it. 
Um, I just don't see someone like those two getting it unless their teams perform a lot better. Well, prime example would be Devontae Graham for the Hornets. Yeah, correct, correct. He had really good stats. Like I know obviously he had a lot more minutes played than he did previously, but his stats jump from like five points a game or something to 18 or somewhere around there. Yeah, you can't, get, you can't be the most improved player if you've won 19 games all season. Yeah, 100%. Because the, for real. Well, the reason is not only are, are you improving as a player, but are you improving enough that it makes a difference on the team and the team's improving? Yeah, 100%. And that's why, yeah, that's really one of the only reasons I see Colin Sexton not getting it. Similar to why De'Aaron Fox will probably never get it. Yeah, firstly, can we bench Seti Osman and just let Kevin Porter Jr. play? Yeah, Kevin Porter Jr. is an absolute stud in the making on the offensive side of the ball. His defensive prowess is very much lacking, but he can score a bucket at any time. And going back to Colin Sexton, I have a feeling that he's actually going to become a player like Lou Williams. Yeah. off the bench okay. and have Darius Garland just be a facilitator because Colin Sexton can put 30, 40 or yeah he can and he, score and we've seen him do that definitely can score but he doesn't get the team involved I know he averages as you said three assists but if you're a starting point guard but I think you... he's moving to the two three is not enough if you're a starting point guard of a roster yeah but he played at the two last season I'm pretty sure he played at the, he played at the shooting guard I just yeah I just don't see him with the amount of time he spends handling the ball even if you're scoring, he needs to lift his up assist per game where he's not going to get it. So if the Cavs get the eighth seed, mm. I think that eighth seed's up for, up for grabs. Especially in the East, yeah, 100%. They could definitely charge towards it if they make a few solid moves or have a... <laughs> and if he puts up Brandon Ingram numbers, he's definitely in the shot with most improved. He's a dog. Like, Cullen Sexton is an absolute dog yeah. on defense. He goes and plays his hard And I feel like it's game. Darius Garland gets away with it and Colin Sexton cops it all when it comes to... Um, defensive failure. Well, and and he, yeah, he definitely does. But you gotta remember as well, rookie Darius Garland. Like it's hard in your first year to be ripped. Like Colin Sexton is the face of the franchise, whether it's a good one or not. Um, when I think of that Cleveland, I think of Colin Sexton, which is so he has to take the brunt of it. Like I know he's only young himself and he's still finding his way in the league, but he's the best player on a garbage team. But do you think he's actually got the role of the face of the franchise yet? Because I don't feel like he has established that. Well, I don't think... In he's terms the of, best player on the team. That's There's what no I'm saying. About in it. terms of Cleveland, like if you're a Cleveland fan, he's your best player and I think he has to be the face of the franchise. I don't think they've given him the face of the franchise. Yeah. But you're right, best player on the team. To me, that's the face of a franchise that doesn't really have a face. So it has to be your best player. Yeah, that's, so what, that's, that's why, what I was saying. Yeah, that's why he's copping a bit of uh, flack. But... As I said, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. If they push for somewhere like the eighth seed, uh, even the ninth seed, and he's playing really well and he's consistent um, and he's kind of leading the charge, no doubt he could get it. Yeah, 100%. So we've moved into the to the semifinals next week, further in the West and the East. What's your game of the week? We'll start with you, Chuck. Oh, Rick, you're going to love me for this, but I really want to see game four tomorrow. Heat and Bucks. Sweep, sweep. Bring I, out the broom. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of want to break out the broom because Fingers I got... cross, man. You know, you, you know, cross. I think, I think it's excited. for two reasons, right? One, obviously, because, you know, I really want to see the Heat go mm. through against the Eastern Conference champions of last year, but also as well, I have a lot of mates that love Giannis, so I just want to send them broom emojis. Yeah, so. John out as a combo. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's my Greek. Giannis means John. <laughs> That's it. So yeah, so heat, heat bucks for me. Brilliant. Rig, Rig Tom uh, Walker, uh, Rig Donis Haslam, Rig Donis getting Riggy with it. Uh, mate, I, I really want to see this Lakers Houston matchup and just see where it goes. I feel like I'm not all in on Houston at the moment after game one. I still think the Lakers can definitely pull it out in five. They've shown that with how they play with Portland. I just you got to get involved, Danny Green, KCP, J.R. Smith, like Javel, Dwight. I just want to see the role players step up and help the King because LeBron seems like he's trying to do what he can do. Uh, AD is obviously doing 25 and 14. Like, that's solid numbers. Um, hopefully Rondo gets some more minutes and he's a bit feeling a bit better. But I also just don't want to see the Rockets go anywhere. I feel like we've been saying that all, all podcasts, to be honest. Wait for Danny Green and KCP to show up and we're still waiting. And it's our it's eighth episode. So if you can do that, please. That'd be great. We're waiting a while. All right. All right. Cheers, fellas. That's it for today's episode. You know, thanks again for tuning in. We've got some really good matchups coming in the next few days. And make sure to check back in with us next week for the rest of the round two of the playoffs. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.